I didn't want to interrupt you with that. Apology. <laughs> That's fine. It's been a, an interesting interruption. All right. Okay. So head up. Off you go. Cheers. Um, okay. So resistance switching um, in general is great because it provides us with a new way of storing information electronically and potentially new ways of computing. Um, and the reason it's say better than flash or transistor based approaches is because we can operate devices with low power um, using you know, less than a volt. We can switch in um, very short times to write and delete information um, of the order of tens of nanoseconds. And for our devices with uh, based on silicon suboxide, we can get high endurance of 10, more than 10 to the seven cycles. So here I'm just showing a couple of um, say the kind of key um, results that I, I'll kind of come back to at the end um, when I conclude. Um, so in, in our gold silicon oxide molybdenum devices, we can get bipolar switching um, within about plus and minus one volt. Um, so low voltage. And the current here is in the order of tens or hundreds of microamps. And we can observe switching events, so in this case, electroforming, um, occurring in tens of nanoseconds. So here, this is the voltage reading across um, the terminals of the scope while the device is forming. So the, the behavior can be extremely quick and very low voltage. Um, so the neuromorphic aspects of silicon, ox uh, silicon suboxide, um, one, one, there are many, uh, neuromorphic behaviors, I suppose, observed in switching devices. But um, two that I'll be talking about are the similarity to synapses and similarity to neurons. So in terms of synapses, um, what we can look at is the potentiation and depression of conductivity. So this is plasticity. And this is looking at as a function of the number of pulses you apply to a synapse. So in this case, we've got a schematic of a mammalian synapse. As you pulse this um, with a input current, you get an, um, a gradual increase and then depression of conductivity. And in, um, in uh, mammalian neurons, for example, in the brain, you have this spike time dependent plasticity. So if you have um, a neuron with signals coming from both sides of the synaptic cleft, depending on the separation between those signals, you get an enhancement or a suppression of the conductivity. This is one behavior that we've observed in silicon oxide. And not, it's not just in silicon oxide, many um, switching devices and many materials have noted this behavior. So this is really exciting for learning behaviors as we can um, produce long-term learning effects in uh, electronic devices. And the other kind of angle on neuromorphic behavior is uh, the similarity to neurons. So in this case, we're looking at the ability of a device or a neuron to fire an action potential in response to an input. So this would be a schematic of a, a neuron, a mammalian neuron, uh, and a, a RAM unit cell. In both cases, we've got some kind of sandwich structure with a channel bridging the, the inside and the outside or the top and the bottom. Um, and this allows us to have an input current in this simplified circuit. You, you put in some current and you end up getting uh, voltage spikes out. So depending on the input current, you get a weighted output in the voltage. So you see nothing at low current and then at some current you get switching on and you get lots of noisy behavior. So this is a kind of selectivity effect of um, neurons. So this, this behavior has been observed in a lot of um, resistance switching devices, but typically the device uh, sizes are much larger than the filament. So the filament's what we want to, or what we believe all of the behavior is based on, and um, whether that's a single filament, or multiple filaments, clusters, um, these, these filaments are very small, in the order of a few to tens of nanometers wide, but most devices are very large. You have tens to hundreds of, hundreds of nanometers to hundreds of micron diameter devices. Um, but really want to know what's happening at the filament. Um, and this work is, the aim of this work was to see whether we could use conductive AFM to probe individual filaments 
to look at this behavior. Can we get potentiation, dep um, depression? Can we get spiking behavior? Um, because the conductive AFM, the uh, width, the diameter of the apex is a few tens of, tens of nanometers. So it's of the same order as uh, a filament. Um, so the first set of measurements here um, are looking at a plasticity effect. So in this case, we're scanning a platinum probe across um, our silicon oxide. So this is an 11 nanometer thick layer on um, molybdenum substrate, it's the bottom electrode. And it's just uh, scanning this whole area in a raster fashion, back and forth with a fixed voltage. And what we see is that over, over the course of, um, in this case, 16 measurements, we see three main features. One is this background region, um, the current gradually increases. And then we see two uh, spots on the left and the right that become very conductive. So I mentioned that the scale bar here is clipped in current. So the peak current is about 13 nanoamps. But you can see clearly that we have one filament appearing and then we eventually have two supposedly filaments appearing. Um, so what's nice about this is not only that we're gradually forming these filaments, um, it's also we have this gradual enhancement of the background effect, which I'll kind of come back to. Um, we can think of this um, methodology of stressing the sample as a kind of pseudo pulsing. So as the tip scans over the surface, it's effectively pulsing each bit, each bit of the area repeatedly. Um, so as it scans over these filaments, it's effectively pulsing them repeatedly and enhancing the conductivity, which is what we, what we see in potentiation of synapses. So if we look at the, the compare these two filament spots here on the left and the right with the background region um, as a function of the scan number. We can see that over the course of the scanning, the conductivity in all the regions increases. And at around scan eight or nine, we start to see the filament on the left, which is this one here, and the current increases quite rapidly until about scan 11, where it becomes stable. Um, and then it starts dropping off again. Um, and what we're looking at here is a comparison between the mean current in this uh, highlighted area of the filament and the maximum current. So the mean current is just a just looking at the area bounded by that box and taking the mean value of the current. The maximum is just the, the maximum in that box. So as the um, maximum stays high, that means we've got a, uh, for, the mean is dependent on the area that is conductive should say. So as we see the mean and the maximum increase, we're getting a more conductive area that's growing. As the maximum stays at a peak, but the mean decreases, we're seeing something shrink while the core stays very conductive. Um, so this looks like a, a potentiation effect where we're increasing the conductivity of the filament and then decreasing it again here. And we can see that for the filament on the right in this box, we get a similar behavior starting to appear around scan 15 or 16. So after this, we reduce the scan voltage to see whether these uh, filaments were stable, whether this was a real effect. And what we can see is that over the course of uh, 45 minutes, roughly, the filament on the right stayed uh, in place and the filament on the left disappeared completely. So this is kind of equivalent to what we're seeing at the end here, where we're starting to depress the first filament as the mean current decreases, but the filament on the right has, has been switched on and remains on. Um, so now scanning with lower voltage, you see that this effect remains. And we also have the enhanced background. Um, this is a nice um, example of potentiating and then depressing uh, individual filaments or small clusters of filaments, where the width here is of around 30 to 40 nanometers for the filament. Um, and coming back to this core shell behavior where we see a distinction between this background effect and the filaments, um, you can get really complicated uh, compound behavior out of this. So there's some interesting um, papers that came out last year looking at all the dynamics you can introduce um, and the potential for integrating these into very complex devices by having the interplay between a core and a shell in your device. Um, so the next thing 
moved on to was looking at trying to probe an individual filament over time. So rather than scanning an area, now the probe is fixed at a single point and we're applying, in this case, a fixed voltage. So um, what we can see is if we apply four volts, um, in this case, applying that to the stage and having the tip grounded, nothing really happens for quite a while. We see a gradual increase in current um, across regions one and two. And then in region three, we get a bit of a bump here into the nanoamps. And then in region four, we enter this much higher current spiky um, regime. And what this indicates is that we have the interplay between um, the filament forming and breaking. So as it forms, it heats up, it disrupts itself, and then the voltage that's applied causes it to reform, it heats up, it disrupts itself. So we get this, this very dynamic behavior here. And we can see if we look at the current maps for these points on the, on the graph, we can see that up to around this region here, we have a very, we have a conductive spot, but it's not hugely conductive. And we only see a few picoamps when we're scanning at um, about seven volts. But when we're in this region here, we have a very conductive spot, um, which reaches the saturation of the detector, around 13 nanoamps. Um, I'll just add an aside here that this behavior, um, I believe corresponds to time, well, it's time dependent dielectric breakdown. And if you look at the time to breakdown, so defining breakdown as the point when we see one nanoamp reached, um, it's exponentially dependent on the field. So this could be indicative of a thermochemical defect generation mechanism. It's still a contentious issue, but um, this is one piece of evidence that might feed into that. Um, so this is nice. We're able to get into this spiky regime and get this dynamic behavior. Um, this so far isn't really using behavior to in a, a functional way. So now if we switch the um, switch the measurement to applying a constant current, again at a fixed point, um, what we can see is that if we apply um, if we if we set the current set point to in this case one nanoamp and gradually increase the voltage, at some point we get a spike in current as the filament forms, and then the system drops the voltage in order to maintain this current set point. And what's quite nice here is that while the set point is maintained, we get very dynamic behavior. So um, this looks a lot like um, spiking in neurons, where we have a, a fixed input and we end up with a spiky output. And then we can start to um, look at the dynamics of this spiking as a function of the input current. So you can see here that we apply 25 picoamps, we get something that's a bit wobbly, a bit wavy. Um, this is really the system just maintaining the set point current. It's not doing anything too exciting. But when we get up to about 250 picoamps, we see much bigger spikes and they look like they're quite frequent. Um, and as we increase the current further, we get to about 2.5 nanoamps. It's harder to see what the distinct difference is. We can see that we have a, a, a big distinction between a low current and a higher current. Um, so if we then take these, these profiles and count the number of spikes in a given time, um, we can see that as we increase the current set point, we get a logistic response in the number of spikes that we count. Um, so this is essentially a, a weighted output in response to the input current, which is, uh, again, a very neuron-like behavior where we see nothing, um, low inputs, and as we reach a kind of nominally or an optimal input, we see a maximum um, output. Uh, so this is quite nice. Um, what's What's quite exciting about it is that we reach this peak uh, spiking rate around 250 picoamps. So this is a very, very low current to observe spiking. Um, so in our previous work, we've seen it in bigger devices when we're applying microamps uh, to milliamps. Um, but being able to get this behavior using picoamps means we can reduce the energy of the spikes, which is would correspond in a in a neuromorphic or neuromorphic 
uh, device to reducing the energy for computation. Um, so we can reduce it quite significantly. Um, so if we look at the energy per spike, so this is for sp spike widths of around 10 milliseconds, just counting these, uh, just measuring these, these widths. Um, what we get is about 10 picojoules pico per spike. Um, so I should mention what this VP here is actually. So this is the threshold for detecting spikes. So um, low VP means we more readily detect spikes. So a spike is anything that is 0.05 volts um, above its background. And the, the much less sensitive um, VP of 0.5 volts is for anything that's 0.5 volts above its background here. So it's the prominence of the, the spikes rather than their absolute magnitude. Um, so as you might expect, we detect more spikes as we increase the sensitivity. So we're more sensitive to these smaller spikes. Um, so using the highest sensitivity, if we're looking at uh, just needing a, a small spike to detect, we can get around 10 uh, picojoules or tens of picojoules per spike. Um, so bring this all together. This is a, a, a nice demonstration of the cure, ooh, suspending mistake, crucial neuromorphic properties of silo, uh, silicon suboxide at a nanoscale. So we can observe plasticity, which is the synaptic, uh, synapse-like behavior, and spiking, which is a neuron-like behavior at the scale of individual filaments or small clusters of filaments. So this isn't looking at a big device and characterizing it um, using large probes in a bigger system. This is looking at tens of nanometers and getting this, this same behavior out. Um, so this is very promising as we, want to, as we look to scale devices down to much smaller dimensions. Uh, one might think optimally of reaching devices which correspond to a single filament or a small cluster of filaments, um, in which case we would expect the behavior to remain and to be extremely low energy. Um, so you can then also think about a nominal ideal device. So this is has some caveats. It's very much an ideal, idealized thought here. But um, what we can see with this spiking is that at around 250 picoamps with conductive AFM, we can get tens of uh, picojoules per spike. And this is applying several volts uh, for spikes that are tens of milliseconds wide. But if we assume an ideal device where we've deposited a top electrode, so we have much better electrical contact between the top electrode and the, uh, the switching layer, um, because with conductive AFM, we have a high contact resistance. Um, what we'd expect is a much lower switching voltage. So we've already seen that we can switch with around a volt. Um, and we've also seen that we can switch with, we can, we have, we've seen switching times of the order of tens of nanoseconds. So if we kind of combine all this, um, we can have, we can think about ideal device that might have an, an optimum energy per spike as low as 25 attojoules, which is um, a very low uh, energy. So that would be a, a very much an ideal device. And if you then scale that to an array of devices, we can think about uh, at 10 hertz having a, a power consumption of 0.6 microwatts per centimeter squared. Of course, this is without any line losses, and this is, again, a very idealized scenario. But it's quite an exciting prospect that we can get this spike in behavior at such low current, so low energy. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so I welcome any questions. And thank you for listening. A couple of questions if while we're waiting for some other audience members if they have any. Um, on the, the spiking behavior, is that this is observed at those filaments that you were pointing to? Yeah, so this is this is effectively so this process of applying a fixed um, a fixed vol a voltage stress at a fixed location produces a very conductive spot, which we assume is either one filament or a small cluster of filaments. So what we're doing here is, is applying a fixed current to form a filament uh, between the probe, across the silicon oxide, between the probe and the molybdenum bottom electrode. 
and private behavior of just that filament. Um, so we get this, this logistic behavior for a single filament rather than for a massive device that we've got ten, hundreds of nanometers or hundreds of microns wide area. Um, so really, really going down to the, the, the filamentary scale. Do you have any idea how like you would integrate that into a circuitry or, or a circuit or a network? Um, well, I, sp I suppose a big hurdle would be fabricating devices at that size, because if if the if you needed something that was ten by ten nanometers wide as a device, it's, it would be a challenge to fabricate. Um, but that's not to say it hasn't been done. I suppose it's it's combining all the aspects, um, getting well, optimizing all the all the materials, of course, in order to get this behavior. So this is quite a thin switching layer for silicon oxide. Usually we work with about 30, uh, 30 nanometers. This was a eleven nanometer oxide. Um, it also uses a platinum tip, and platinum's quite expensive. So you, you can argue that's not an ideal material to use in, um, in real devices. But I wonder if like when people are going down the self assembly route and you're not having to do it through lithography, maybe those kind of contact areas that you have here, 10 nanometers by 10 nanometers arise anyway, so you can. Yeah, that's a point. I mean, you can, you can get some really nice structures with self assembly. So yeah, um, I imagine there'd be complexity, but if you say you had a two-dimensional array of these things or three-dimensional array of contact points, you'd get, you'd get some more complexity in addressing the points. I mean, if you had lots of, lots of um, adjacent devices with varying conductivity, you might get some weird behavior, but that might be really useful. You might get some really nice immersion behavior if you have an array of things with different properties, um, that'd be a nice function. Imagine complex spikes coupled with other complex spikes. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's I'm sure it would have some sort of use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I don't think there's any other questions. So thank you very much, Mark, uh, for that. Yeah. If we're gonna- Maybe, Excuse me, can, can I make a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, Yes, Mark. In uh, in this slide that you are showing, actually, uh, maybe you just, you you said this, but uh, maybe I missed. Which is your interpretation about this fact that um, increasing the current, uh, well, the the noise, the this behavior changes. Uh, I mean, it's changing both the amplitude of of these uh, fluctuations, but also. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, let's say the the frequency. So, how do you explain this? So it doesn't really affect the magnitude of the or the amplitude of the spikes. So, once you see some spikes, if you look at twenty five peak amps, there's not really any spikes. There's some slow effects, but there's no spikes. Um, but when we start to see spikes, the spike amplitude stays quite constant and it's the, the frequency of the spikes that changes. So- Yes, in, in, uh, yes indeed, indeed it was interested in the switch uh, between, uh, in the change between 25 and uh, 250, I mean, why, why there is this important change from blue to, to red? So my, what, what I would imagine is happening is that when you form a filament using 25 picoamps, um, you get something which is not close to resetting. So you, hmm. you input some energy and you break the active layer a little bit and you have something which is kind of stable. Um, but when you maintain 25 picoamps, you don't force that filament into resetting. Whereas when you apply slightly higher currents, say 250 picoamps, you form something and then heat it up and it starts to break. And as it breaks, um, because you've got a current set point, well, as it breaks, the current starts to decrease 
So in order to maintain the set point, the instrument ramps up the voltage and you get a, a spike. Um, and when you get that spike, the current goes up. So the voltage comes back down because the device resistance has decreased. And you get this kind of cycle of rupturing and reforming of the filament as the instrument maintains this, um, this current outflow. Okay, I, I see. Okay, cool. So if we want to move on. Sure. Next up is uh, Stefano, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, oxide characterization and ionic uh, telegraph noise, if I got that correct. Yes. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. Let's see if I can also show my pointer. Can you see it? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dan. Right. Um, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, indeed, I was um, asked to prepare a presentation on this. Uh, this that we call stimulated ionic telegraph noise in filamentary memoristos. Um, just let me introduce uh, me and my institute. I work for the National Research Council in Italy, which is divided in many institutes. Um, and I work for the Institute for Micro Electronics and Microsystem in the unit of Agrate Brianza, in which we deal with several topics. And uh, my reference topic is emerging memories for neuromorphic application or alternative computational schemes in general, in which uh, I will introduce in the next slide. Um, so as you may know, neural computation up to now is uh, uh, widely used for any kind of application. And uh, it makes use uh, uh, intense use of memory because uh, it has deals with uh, um, a lot of vector matrix multiplication with uh, uh, very, um, very big uh, vectors and matrices. And in order to do that in a standard computer, actually you need to um, load the data from the memory and do the computation with that and then uh, restore the, the results in the memory. And so you have a, a lot, um, a continuous transfer of information from the memory to the logic which consumes a lot of power and wastes a lot of time. So, and this is called uh, the von Neumann's bottleneck that is a, an, an energy and also a speed computation problem. Emerging memories, uh, which are the kinds of memory that are listed here, uh, can come to help us um, because they are compatible with the back end of the line fabrication processes of the chips or silicon chips. They are non-volatile at low programming energies and they guarantee a fast access uh, different from conventional non-volatile memories like flash. And also they support cross bar organization that um, allows to uh, evaluate a vector matrix multiplication in one step without uh, moving um, data from memory to, to logic, which is quite fascinating for neuromorphic computation and in memory computation in general. Um, so resistor switching devices, just to give you an introduction, are uh, metal oxide metal uh, devices in which uh, if you apply a certain voltage, for example, uh, uh, a positive voltage, you go from high resistance to a low resistance state. And if you apply the opposite voltage polarity where you can, you can go back from the low to the high resistance state. Uh, the device that we speak about uh, um, comprises these elements, hafnium oxide as an insulator layer. And the switching in our devices is a filamentary in the sense that uh, when you apply a voltage, uh, you can form or uh, disrupt partially a filament shorting or disconnecting the two electrodes. So this is defining the, the resistance states. And this filament is um, a region in which uh, an accumulation of oxygen vacancies and defects that trigger the, the, the electrical conduction, um, an accumulation that is present in a filamentary shape. So, uh, these emerging memory devices 
um, well, they have been emerging since a long time, actually. And they have been used uh, in the past mainly for memory application. While in the latest years, they have been applied for several applications in which neuromorphic is may, maybe the, the, the main one. Uh, but actually the switching of application, the, the changing in the application uh, also defines a different way of using the, the device. For example, for memory application, typically you want something like an exact programming, which you want to apply a set voltage and get in a non-state. Uh, applying a reset voltage, I get in an off state. Uh, I mean, as a matter of principle, uh, I, don't, I don't want to consider variability here, but you want this kind of, a, of a response for your device. In your morphic application, typically instead, you want uh, a state dependent operation for many different kinds of neuromorphic application. A state dependent op operation that works like this. So you stimulate your device with trains of identical passes and maybe you can read in between the passes so you can monitor the resistance evolution. But it, it happens uh, in an analog multi-level device like this that uh, for example, if you send a pass when the resistance of the device is here, you go here. But if you apply a pass when the resistance is here, well, you go here. So the final resistance state uh, depends, the final resistance value depends on the state and the past history of the device. This is true for multi-level devices like this one, analog devices or stochastic devices in which you have only two states, for example. In any case, you have a state-dependent plasticity, uh, state-dependent uh, operation, sorry. Um, um, and the fact that uh, you have to characterize and use the devices in a different way uh, allows us to look at the physics of these devices uh, from a different perspective. And this is an opportunity to finding something uh, new, something unexplored in the past. And this is what happened to us. For example, we noticed uh, that uh, in our switching dynamics, that is indeed the disevolution of the resistance or conductance as a function of the train of identical passes, you can see that on top of this average change in the resistance uh, or conductance, like in black line here, you have always uh, an important noise on top. And this is not a peculiarity to our device. I mean, our devices are quite uh, conventional in agreement. They are quite in agreement with others in the literature, but also in the literature, you can see that there is a lot of noise uh, around uh, the average resistance change, okay? And this is something interesting. Also the group of Temis Prodromakis in Southampton, uh, they, um, develop a descriptive model of this noise because they realize that it is not actually something um, well known. And indeed, it is not a reading noise as we demonstrate with this measurement in which uh, we send to the device uh, trains of identical passes over a constant uh, voltage level of um, 100 millivolt just to read the device. As you can see here, uh, the, the spikes trigger a current change, uh, a current uh, jump, let's say. And in between the, sp the passes, the, the current is more, or, is more or less stable. The important thing is that uh, uh, actually the, the, the current is overall quite uh, uh, on average is stable. So there is not a drift on, on, on higher or lower currents, which is somehow unexpected because as I showed you before, these devices are typically bipolar since, I mean, if you apply a positive voltage, you get a resistance increase, a negative voltage, you get a resistance decrease. But here we apply always the same voltage and we get a current increasing and decreasing. But also if we take out the spikes and lead just a constant low voltage uh, to the device, what we see is uh, a signal that is um, that has a, a much lower noise level, indicating that the noise, these uh, jumps in the current are actually stimulated by the pulses. Uh, 
and it is not a reading noise, okay? Because the, the reading noise level is just this one in the bottom graph. Um, we call this telegraph noise because it resembles a lot the telegraphic noise, uh, which I tried to introduce here briefly. The conventional random telegraph noise is, is an electronic effect that is visible in nanoscale electronic devices. In any uh, case in which you have a current flowing through a very thin path, because if you have a very thin path as can be a, a filament of a resistance switching device. And uh, uh, close to this uh, um, thin path, you have a trap that can capture and emit uh, uh, an electron. Once, in, in case an electron is there, the, the electron produces an, ele an electric field that shields uh, the, the electron conduction and therefore inhibit the conduction in the path. And therefore you have two states uh, for the current in case there is a, an electron here or an electron here or there isn't an electron here. So uh, you have this kind of telegraphic noise. And this occurs so if you apply a constant voltage, occurs with uh, an average uh, um, a capture and emission times that are in the range of few milliseconds once you apply a reading voltage uh, that uh, is low because it, you want to probe an electronic effect, okay? Uh, what we saw actually it is completely different from this because uh, we see this noise uh, only for high voltages because the, the current jumps are triggered by high voltages, relatively high voltages. And uh, uh, the jump in the current is red at low voltages and even if it's red at low voltages, well, the, the jump, the, the current after the pulse is stable for more than one second. So it, it is like a sort of non-volatile effect and uh, the non-volatility in these kind of devices is due to ionic uh, configuration. That's why we think that this noise has an ionic origin. Um, let me, uh, show you how to characterize this noise. We can start, this noise is particularly visible for a reset transition, the meaning um, resistance increase. So we start from a low resistance state and apply a trains of identical pulses. In the first phase, you have an average resistance change on top of which there is uh, some stimulated telegraph noise, but here you have two effects that are not so easy to disentangle, to be disentangled. Well, at some point the resistance, the average resistance change um, stabilizes. So there is no average resistance change. And here you can isolate the stimulated telegraph noise. So it is uh, something like uh, an approaching to an equilibrium condition in which uh, the equilibrium here is dynamic actually. And to have a dynamic equilibrium, you have to have Mm, two forces, at least two tendencies, opposite tendencies that uh, uh, are facing and uh, some, mm, sometimes they one wins and sometimes the other win. But, um, okay, let me go to the characterization first. Uh, we did all this characterization for um, a, lo a lot of time width for the passes and a lot of voltages. And we see that for weak programming conditions, so short and small passes, we don't get any resistance change by increasing the strength of the programming conditions. We increase the resistance, uh, the final resistance value. Okay, so increasing the, the amplitude or the time width of the passes. And actually you see also that the noise amplitude increasing correspondingly, but this is not actually due itself, but this, Mm, by the amplitude, by the strength of the pulses, it is because this, this very precise correlation exists between the noise amplitude and the average resistance value. So depending on where your device is with the resistance, well, you get a different noise amplitude. So to model this, uh, we were looking about these two competing tendencies I was speaking about earlier. 
And indeed, the resistance switching in, uh, in these devices is usually described uh, with the physics of di drift and diffusion of uh, ions. There are oxygen vacancies, typically. And um, so, and so there are two competing uh, tendencies. Interestingly, it was also the group from of uh, Reiner Vases in this paper mentioned the possibility of a balancement between uh, drift and diffusion during the reset. And uh, uh, so we try to enter the, the details here by using a very simple model taken from uh, one of the, the Minis group actually. Uh, so after the reset, so after you have an average resistance change and the resistance change then stabilizes, typically you have an interrupted filament. So there is a, a, um, some portion of the filament uh, which remains there and you have a high concentration of oxygen vacancies there. You have a, a low resistance, al almost a metallic, uh, metallic like filament. And there is a region in which the, a gap exists. Uh, so a region in which the concentration of defects is very low and it is an insulating region so that you have a high resistance state because of this gap. If you assume a shape for your concentration of defects, you can uh, evaluate the diffusion term, so the gradient of this concentration profile. And you can see that diffusion is actually acting at the edges between filament and gap. And the same is true also for the drift term, because the drift can be evaluated as the multiplication of the electric field times the uh, defect concentration. But the electric field is actually almost dropping entirely on the gap because it's the only insulating element in this um, series, if you consider this as an electrical circuit. Uh, and you can see that the drift term is actually acting almost only at the edges between gap and filament. And you can think about uh, the diffusion as trying to, um, to smooth out the concentration gradients here. So trying to move from this condition to this one. Well, and the drift can only do the opposite thing that is uh, trying to enlarge the gap and trying to sharpen the, the filament gap interface. So these are the two competing processes, ionic processes that in our opinion, can drive the resist the, the stimulated noise. Indeed, if you if you assume a, a certain concentration profile as here with uh, different gaps in order to describe different average resistance value, and you apply a small uh, um, tilt as a small uh, change of the slope at the interface, actually, what you which can be in our model, uh, a measure of the um, the noise amplitude, okay? If you apply this, well, what you get is actually a noise amplitude that, that follows the average resistance value exactly as the, the, the experimental data. So with this, uh, we, we believe we have demonstrated that this noise is something that is not conventional at all something that was not characterized in details um, earlier, also because uh, we were looking to some uh, unconventional programming of these devices in view of neuromorphic applications. So, um, so I hope you, I have I demonstrated that the stimulated telegraph noise is an interesting issue that is uh, affecting the resolution of filamentary devices of analog filamentary devices, and there are so much important for neuromorphic application, but maybe it can also be an opportunity if you want to uh, develop some stochastic processes in the memory store. And uh, okay, before thanking you for, your, for the attention, I would like to advertise this Frontiers topic that is, it is still open on biologically plausible implementation of near functions. So it is not restricted to memory store. So whatever technology that is biologically plausible is welcome. 
And also that we are looking for two postdocs, one for a national project in which we would like to develop oscillator-based computing, and uh, uh, a European project in which we would like to address uh, neuromorphic networks for real-time and lifelong learning. And uh, okay, I thank you for the attention and thank them for the organization. Cheers, thank you very much, Stefano. Um, so quick question, um, maybe I missed this. So in the, like, on the last slide, where you have the noise amplitude versus resistance. Yes. I didn't quite understand, how do you go from the defect distribution and the drift and diffusion forces to that noise amplitude? Um, so, um, it's quite a crude model. I mean, the, the, the diffusion is trying to, as I told, to, to try to smooth uh, this profile. So the, the smoothing can be described as a change of this slope, like it is represented here. Okay. So in this model, I actually use a, a shape like this. Um, the, they are two hyperbolic tangents that in which you can define the slope here um, in order to catch the average resistance value i uh, consider different uh, gap lengths that are defined as uh, the half uh, half height distance between these two points you know in this way, you can obtain different resistance value. And on top of this, I apply a small change here in the slope. And, if I, and I evaluated the, the difference in resistance between the case in which you have the, the initial slope and the, the, the modified slope. So in this way, I obtain two resistance values for each gap length. And I consider as the noise amplitude, the difference between these two values. Okay, I see. So in the, in the original telegraph theory, the change is caused by a change in the electronic structure. But in here, you get a structural change, which is stable because it's ionic. And that yes. causes the, Okay, I see, okay. Okay, cool. Do you think there's any uh, analog or similarity um, between the spiking, the the uh, this, this kind of spiking, and what we saw in the, the CAFM data, so Mark's data, um, does it look similar? Maybe it it can be actually. Uh, here it is stimulated by pulses, and this allows to to characterize it uh, in. Um, in, in a simpler way. So the pulses are, are actually a mean to, to allow us to, to investigate this noise uh, more easily, I think. If you apply a constant voltage, uh, uh, I think it's more tricky um, because uh, in... Um, because you, you don't never know uh, if, uh, well, I don't know. Um, it, it can be the same, the, the, the same noise that Mark showed uh, can be some, some ionic noise like this. Um, but the distinction between the, the I mean, the passes allows you to apply a voltage, a high voltage, and then read with a low voltage. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you you can disentangle the reading noise from any other effect, or, or uh, I mean, you you have a, the the stimulation of the noise, and then the characterization of which is the 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 current resistance level. If you apply a high voltage constant, uh, you always have uh, some uh, temperature effect uh, 
you have uh, a, a continuous movement of ions, maybe. And so I, I think it's a bit uh, difficult to to characterize in that case in details. You have a you have to develop a quite complex model, maybe. Right, I see. So the, the pulse is causing like an instantaneous change, which is unaffected by the read voltage. And you're just yeah. capturing your image of that almost each time you do a pulse. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Mark, do you have anything? I was just going to add on that point. Um, going to add on that point. Um, uh, probably agree with uh, Steph and I that like, because it's a, in, in the CFM case, it's a constant stress the the actual phenomenon may be different i suppose what is similar in a sense or kind of analog is that you have this competition between two processes so you have one thing that's trying to make your device more conductive and one that's trying to make it less conductive and it's that dynamic between or that that dynamic competition that gives you this interesting behavior that we can use Okay, great. So Adnan uh, has a question uh, to follow up on this. Hey, Stefano. Can you hear Hi. me, guys? Uh, yes. Excellent. Hi, how's it going? Uh, nice yes. presentation. So I, I was just wondering, have you checked for any scaling effects? Um, I, I like the model, and I think it's it's Mansell's model that you use this try to model the, the noise. Um, so I'm just trying to understand if the things that you're seeing, do you think they are only constrained to the filament or you also might be the background? So if you go to change the size of the devices, do you actually see that the dynamics of these noise changes in, in any major way? And the other question that I have is, um, do you see, uh, see this same effect uh, for any resistance states, regardless if it's low resistance state or high resistance state, do you still see this effect? So I think both questions are related. Do you think this is only the, uh, the filament effect or the background might be doing something like trapping, detrapping or something like that? That's obviously important if you want to scale down these devices. Is it actually filament that we are now probing, or it might actually be something else? Uh, okay, so uh, okay, an interesting so. question. Uh, I will start from the second question. Uh, the noise is visible, whatever the the resistance state, but uh, as I showed here. The, the lower the resistance, the lower the noise. Okay, that's the point. Uh, also in this graph here, for example, you have noise and follows this in the same trend. Uh, maybe with this resistance here that is very small, uh, probably there you don't have noise or the noise is a problem of visualization. But in any case, uh, you have this trend. So with a low resistance, you have a low noise and, and therefore maybe at some point it becomes comparable with the reading noise itself. Uh, a different thing is if you see this telegraphic noise, for example, during set. So you apply your passes with the opposite polarity, what happens there? It is not exactly clear. The fact that uh, you have this uh, dynamic competition between uh, drift and diffusion is, uh, I would say it is um, uh, reasonable for the reset. Uh, I don't know if it is really reasonable for set. Uh, so. The, the set is a bit tricky to investigate. There is some noise also in the set in our data, but it is quite difficult to, to understand. Um, okay, that is for the second question. For the first question about uh, the bulk, okay. Um, um, I don't think uh, that the bulk uh, is important here. I'm trying to figure out uh, if there is any evidence from our data. I, I mean, the model is actually fitting the model 
is fitting this line uh, properly and the model does not take into account the bulk and, and this is i mean the, the standard uh, answer if you wish but uh, i'm wondering uh, if uh, if you take into account also some noise from the bulk uh, maybe you should have seen something at uh, high resistance values here, maybe some saturation at some point, but um, well, I don't know. My my so my idea know. is that my, the bulk is not important. My idea is that the bulk is not important. I think I don't have an evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I don't have an evidence. Uh, yeah, I guess the reason why I'm asking is you have a Daniel's model with the RTNs, so that obviously treats the filament, and then you have a trapping at a defect, and there is basically the fusion region, and you see this kind of very discrete steps up and down. Uh, but if I understood this correctly, and the model that you have with the equilibrium of diffusion and drift is slightly different. Um, so yeah, yeah, I understand. Maybe it's not uh, that easy to directly check if it's a filament or the background, but maybe one thing would be to see if there is just a scaling effect. So if you go from micro-sized uh, devices to something which is very large or very small, um, do you see that this uh, effect persists? And is it sort of the same type of phenomenological behavior? Mm. But by the way, the resistances mm. here are by the way, the resistances so, um, here are not so high. Um, not so high. So I, I really believe that the oxide, so the surrounding really oxide, is the oxide, much the more surrounding insulated, oxide insulated than much more than the filament insulated itself. Than, than the filament itself. Yeah, that, that's a good point. If the pristine conductance is, is very low, then yeah, I, I guess that's that's definitely true. Okay, yes, thank yes. you. Sorry, it is a very interesting yes, result yes. and something that we also see in other devices. So I'm, I'm just trying to see if there are some links here because we also have been exploring some devices which are preformed and we see a kind of interesting transient behavior. So yeah, I'm trying to make some connections here, but yeah, maybe a slightly different story. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, great, thank you. So if uh, no one has any other questions, I think we're running over time, so we might have to call it quits. Thank you very much again to speakers, uh, Stefano and Mark. Really appreciate it. And then hopefully we can organize some more stuff in the future. So thank, thank you very much. You, ben. Thank um, you for organizing, Ben. Thank you for listening. No worries. Okay, see you around. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. It was great. Bye -bye. Great presentations. Thank you.